above all else? We choose Christ. We choose Christ. Above all else. Would you stand with me in body or spirit as we join together in our call to worship? Come, friends, let us worship the living God. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Is the name of the Lord. And would you please remain standing and let's join together in Him 103, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Will you pray with me the opening prayer? Sovereign God, source of all life and bright light of the world, you came to your creation with gentleness of heart and lived among your people with compassion, love, and healing. By curing the sick and opening the eyes of the blind, you showed your great love and mercy to all humanity. Open, Open the, the eyes, eyes of, of your, your church, church, we, we pray. pray and spark our, our faith into a mighty light that shines brightly in, the in a world of dark, dark shadows. Through Christ Jesus, the light of the world, we pray. Amen.
In the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, I greet you. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here, and so I hope you'll take a moment to turn to the people who are standing near you before taking your seats and say, good morning, and it's wonderful to see you too. That's the treat. It is a joy to be with you this morning, and especially a welcome to those who are with us in the online format this morning. Uh, it's great that we have this opportunity to worship side by side, uh, to worship the Lord, and we, to receive the fulfillment of that promise that wherever two or more have gathered in the name of Christ, he will be with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we make these holy moments together, and we set aside all of the work of the week all of the mundane and temporal affairs of our life, and we bask in the holiness of God, and we celebrate his presence in our lives. I do want to bring to your attention a couple of calendar reminders. First of all, this coming Wednesday, we will have another installment of our Lenten soup suppers. I think I remember saying it was going to be a corn chowder this week, and so that's something you might look forward to. Uh, and also, we'll have Bible study that night, Far better to uh, nurture the spirit uh, than feed the body, I think. Uh, so we'll be uh, enjoying our next installment of our study of Nehemiah. You'll want to make sure that you're present for that. There is a sign-up slip so that our caterer knows how much to, uh, to soup to make. So if you'll fill that out and make sure it makes its way into the offering plate today, I'd be grateful. Then on April 1st, yes, April 1st, can you believe it? It's a Saturday, and from 10 in the morning until approximately 2 in the afternoon, with lunch provided, we'll be taking our next step in this congregational assessment process that we are undergoing. So I want to make sure that you have Saturday, uh, uh, April 1st, and that is the beginning of Holy Week on Sunday that week. So uh, you'll want to make sure that the day before Palm Sunday, you come down and let your voice be heard as we uh, seek uh, to know how God is moving our congregation forward through this process. Also, uh, a reminder that we will be worshiping uh, on Sunday for Palm Sunday, and then every night of Holy Week, Monday through Friday, we will gather here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. be a simple service of, um, of prayer and meditation and a reading of the Word on Monday through Wednesday. We'll have a communion service with our choir uh, on Holy Thursday, and then Friday will be a service of darkness or a tenebrae service. Now, all of these should be available online as well, so make your plans now to be a part of the worship experience for Holy Week. I promise you, those who make the journey throughout Holy Week always come to Easter in a different space because they have walked with Christ through the cross. And some of the passages we talk about during Holy Week are passages we don't get to during the rest of the lectionary cycle. So it's wonderful to experience that uh, last bit of Jesus' earthly ministry together. Okay, you have some calendar items in front of you now. So let's uh, set those aside. Let's take a deep breath. Let's find our centered place. And let's uh, prepare to hear the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my Good morning. Please join me in the responsive psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside still waters, restores my life. Leads me in right paths for the sake of the Lord's name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. 
for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. As he walked along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on, mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Shalom. Then the man went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? It is he. No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him. Then, then how, how were your eyes opened? opened? The man who was healed answered. The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where, Where is, is he? he? He said, I do not know. The Jewish leaders did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son? whom you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leadership. For they had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So, for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. He answered, We know that this man is a sinner. I don't. I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely of sin, and you're now trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, 
And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped Jesus. And Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this, and they said to him, Surely, Surely we are, we are not, not blind, blind are, we? are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The word of God for the people of God. Pray with me. Speak, O Lord, with the sound of a thousand cataracts, the thunderous sound of creation itself. Speak, O Lord, to our hearts in whispers. Speak, O Lord, 
Help us to find your voice among the many. Help us to receive your word planted deeply in our hearts. Speak, O Lord, that your servants may obey. In Christ's name, amen. What an odd passage in this ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. After Jesus had spoken with the woman at the well in chapter 4, he got into a little more mischief in the temple. He was walking around during one of the festivals, and in the Gospel of John, Jesus doesn't make a single trip to the temple in Jerusalem, but he makes a trip at all three of the festivals to uh, Jerusalem to fulfill his duty as a good Jew. But he sees a man lying by a pool near the pool of Bethsaida in Jerusalem. Those of you in the Bible study can look at your map and find it on the map that was handed out. At, pool, at Bethsaida had a tradition that when an angel troubled the waters in the pool, the first one to jump into the pool would be healed. He saw a man lying there for 38 years. He was crippled. And Jesus uh, said to him, do you want to be healed? And the man said, well, in the last 38 years, it had crossed my mind once or twice, but I don't have anyone to put me into the pool when the angel troubles the water. And so Jesus said, well, forget that. Take up your mat and walk home. And the man picked up his mat and decided to walk home. But it was the Sabbath. And so some of the temple officials saw him carrying his mat back to his house I mean, a good mat is hard to find, and you don't want to just leave it lying there. Somebody else would take it from you. And they said, why are you doing labor on the Sabbath? Can you imagine lying around for 38 years and you get cured on the wrong day of the week? That's just bad timing. And so the man told them that Jesus had done it. He, he finked on Jesus and so it's another Sabbath. And so the authorities in and around the temple are already keeping an eye on Jesus because he's doing disruptive things. And the disciples enter from stage left, and they ask Jesus as they're walking by, look, there's a guy who's blind. So who sinned? Was it him or what his parent, was it his parents? Because there are prophecies that say, you know, the children will eat sour, uh, I mean, the parents will eat sour grapes and their children will have their teeth set on edge. That the sins of the mothers and fathers will be visited on the sons and daughters throughout the generations. So who was it, Lord? Did this guy do the deed or was it his parents? This is the port of entry for many religious conversations in our culture. It's unexplained suffering. And if there's one thing that human beings can't stand, it's the mystery of an unanswered question. We simply can't abide in that space. I don't have a reason for why all of this is happening, but I'm going to make one up. Even if it's not true, the making up of a false answer feels so much better to me than living in the mystery of the unknown. Why is this man blind? i got to have an answer, Jesus. Was it this or was it this? Now, when we come to conversations about God and we only have... There you are. Uh, when we come to conversations about God and we only have two alternatives, then we must pin the answer down on one or the other alternative. But this is not how to come to mystery. We come to mystery with our hearts open to possibilities that we may never have heard or seen or conceived before. And that's how the apostle said it. And sometimes when you're open to such things, all of a sudden, the veil is parted, and you end up saying, oh, I see. I see how this works. Now, the temple in Jerusalem was a going concern. It was a religious enterprise, and it was the pride of the Jewish people because nations were coming from around the world to see the splendor of the temple. 
And Herod, when he had it fully restored, had really built something. It was remarkable. It was also a great source of fundraising for the religious authorities. You know, the remarkable thing about this ninth chapter of the Gospel of John is that Jesus doesn't have a very big role in it. He is talking with the disciples, not with the man who was born blind. They ask him, so who sinned? And he said, nobody sinned. This hasn't happened because somebody sinned. This has happened so that God's glory can be put on display. Right there, you lose half of the people you try to witness to in this world. I could never believe in a God that blinds a man so that God can show off and show the world. Well, this is not a, a, a true reading of this moment with Jesus. I think a better reading might be that Jesus was trying to say, people are blind sometimes. It happens. But in the darkness of this world, the light of God can shine brighter. And since we are in a season when we're talking about shadows and light, about doing the works of God during the daytime because the night is coming, in the, in the midst of this, Jesus was saying, let's get the morality out of the way. This is not a sin question. This is, so, this is a glory of God, a works of God question. <clears throat> and he spits on the ground. He makes a little mud takes the mud and he wipes it in the man's eyes. How can you cure blindness? Well, according to Genesis uh, chapter two and three, we were made from that stuff. Man needs eyes, you just make some eyes on the ground and you stick them in. Then he told the man, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man went. Notice he didn't tell him to go seek a priest, which he has done in other places, to confirm his cleanliness. He, he's trying to keep the religious authorities out of this. And uh, the man washed his face in the pool, and he said, oh, oh, I see. I see. I get it now. That's the last we hear of Jesus until the end of the passage the footnote at the end. The rest of this passage is about you and me. People struggling with religious questions, religious problems, and disciples are sitting on the sideline here. This is about the people that sit around our Thanksgiving tables. This is about the people that we have barbecue with in Memorial Day and, and Fourth of July. This is about people who have learned enough answers to kind of Put the brakes on the religious question. This is actually about the tempter, the adversary, the one who comes to the church and says, why are you sitting out here in the wilderness eating rocks? Turn some of them into bread. The Gospel of John has come to tell us that there is a world all around us that is as real as the one that our five senses can receive. But it is a world whose gateway is through the heart and through the soul and not through the head. We receive God in a place that doesn't make sense. Not in the classical word, use of that word. But it is nonetheless real. And Jesus said it to Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is, is in spirit. And unless we are begotten from above by both, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. Oh, see. Oh, I see. If we are dead spiritually, this, this leads us to a, a, a theological term that we don't often talk about in our world, at least our world of Methodism. And yet it's a very Methodist word, and the word is regeneration, that there's a part of us, a soul in us, that has atrophied through sin. We were born with an atrophied soul. And one of the things that happens, said John Wesley, when we receive Christ and put our whole trust in him is that that soul is regenerated, or it begins the process of regeneration at least. And as we are going on to perfection, the nature of Christ which resides in that soul comes to crowd out the nature of sin which resides in our flesh. 
And both exist, but until they are brought into an agreement, until they are brought into resurrection, until they are brought into a whole integration of the self, we still struggle to, to understand and to, and to know. And, and part of our struggle is that we've been sold a bill of goods that began in about the third century after Christ. When Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And then the editors of the Roman Empire sat down and they began to rewrite some of our thoughts about Christ until Jesus took on all the attributes of a good and proper, righteous, king-like, conquering emperor. A God you can believe in. We gave to God almighty power because Caesar had almighty power. I could never serve a God who allows wars in Ukraine. I could never serve a God who allows suffering in this world. Friends, I'm going to say it today, and I hope we all hear it. I hope my, I can hear it. The wars and the suffering and all of this are not caused by God. That's not how God set up the world. Shalom and the peace of God is the default setting. Somebody came in the night and switched it over to something else. The theologians will say, you can have an almighty God or you can have an all-loving God, but you can't have both anymore because Holocaust, baby, God's own people, six to eight million, dying to satisfy what? That wasn't Yahweh that asked for that. It was Hitler. Hitler asked the church in his time to fly swastikas from the pulpit instead of the pyramids. And some of them went along with it because the disruption of saying no to him at that time would have been too much for them. But others didn't, and they kept the faith. They said, oh, I see what's happening here, and we can't go with this. They wrote the Barman Declaration, which says, we have no Fuhrer but God. But the weapons that God uses to combat evil in this world are not the kinds of weapons we're used to seeing. It's an inestimable love, an unflinching tenacity to proclaim the works of God. It is the peace of Christ that passes all understanding and that most obnoxious of all weapons, forgiveness. Five, six little words that you can say I was wrong. I am sorry. And it disarms everything. But we can't get there when we are trying to reason through it and make sense of it. This man who was blind with mud pasted on his face had the one attribute necessary to open the kingdom of God to him. When he was sent to the pool of Siloam, which means sent, he obeyed. He did what God asked him to do, and his eyes were opened. Talk about disruptions. This set the church leader's hair on fire, which is why I look the way that I do if you ever see someone dressed like me, be careful. You don't have to do everything that someone dressed like me tells you to do. Because we have one foot in organized religion and one foot with Christ. And as these move apart over time, well, you get the picture. It gets harder and harder to stand. There are times throughout our history when the dominant and I mean dominant, organized religion, religious leaders of the day needed to be brought themselves into a season of confession. And God, <laughs> God thought we were going to get all enthralled with the miracle of a man having his eyes and his sight restored to him. But when Jesus said, this has happened so that God might be glorified, he was talking about what came next in the passage. 
a man who never could read and write because he didn't have the eyes for it, is standing toe-to-toe with the best of the religious leadership of his day, and he is outmaneuvering them in thought, philosophy, theology, in faith. Until they, in exasperation, said, you were born entirely a sin, in sin, and you're trying to teach us? I never said I was born entirely in sin. What are you talking about? How did he heal you? I already told you. Do you want to be his disciple? We only go with what Moses said. We don't believe in messiahs. We are the religious word for this day. And Jesus (laughs) sends this man to them. It never, from the time of Adam until now, has it ever been heard of that a man born blind has received his sight. And you still can't believe that this man comes from God? Who else could do this? And their answer is to kick him out of the church. Did I say church? Well, synagogue functioned that way in Jesus' day. Slaves becoming free men, and they say, you can't do that, and they kick them out of the church. People of varied race get married together and they say, you can't do that in our kingdom, and they kick them out of the church. A woman filled and anointed with all of the Holy Ghost stands up to preach the gospel and they say, you can't do that, and they kick her out of the church. And so on, and so on, and so on, until finally the enemy comes and he cleaves the church itself and said, Democrats on the left, Republicans on the right. And somebody stands up full of the Holy Spirit and says, here's what I see going on in the world and here's how God does it. And the other side says, you can't do that. And they kick him out of the church. We are already seeing the Spirit of God move around us. But when the Spirit of God moves, it is incredibly disruptive, always. The status quo is in danger, brothers and sisters. And you can look around, look around, look around the whole room. There's nobody in here who is causing it. I hate to let you down, but if you thought you were that powerful, you're not. And God knows the clergy aren't. This is God's doing. And when it's a shepherd boy who becomes a king, Psalm 118 says, this is God's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Oh, I see. My eyes can see. The little waif takes down Goliath. The little waif finds bickering and arguing tribes of Israel like little children who want theirs and they can't play well in the sandbox together, and he shepherds them all together with a shepherd's heart. King David, who catches himself in sin, and instead of making up excuse after excuse, and he has the power of the king, he can blame anybody, but he says, have mercy upon me, O Lord. Purge me with hyssop. For if my atrophied soul doesn't grow strength, the Holy Spirit has no place to alight within me. But as it grows stronger, the Spirit can land there in my inner self. The Greek word is splagnitzomai, you know, that passion that you feel. Everything we seek is predicated on a God who moves in such a way that somebody stands up and says, oh, I see, I see. Jesus isn't even Jesus to this man when he is healed. This is how awesome God's love is. He doesn't know to ask for Messiah. This isn't the man sitting on the side of the road on the way to Jerusalem, crying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This man's just laying there, taking up a day. And he does nothing. In fact, Jesus doesn't even ask him, do you want to see? 
He doesn't even ask his permission. He says to the disciples, this has nothing to do with sin. This is about the glory of God. And he bends down, and if you're a blind man and you can't see what's coming and somebody's sticking stuff in the eye portion of your face, this guy has done nothing to deserve this healing any more than he's done nothing to deserve being blind. This passage is a revelation about the heart of God who also wants people who are dressed like me to see his awesome power, the power to save, the power of grace. But alas, there are people like me who are dressed in this way. There are lay leaders and there are committee members and committee chairs and others who are so burdened down with just keeping things the way we need to keep them and, and making sure that it's all taken care of that we can't see spiritually. And we tend to treat people who do like they're going to create one more layer of problems that we don't have any. My problem page is full. I don't have any more time for this. We are called by God to give the glory to God so that our lives may be used by God. And the only say we might have in the matter is to acknowledge what God has done. But for some of us, that's an answer that isn't in our multiple choice test. And so we say it's got to be this or it's got to be that. He's got to be a sinner, and so is the man who healed him. Think about that sentence for a second. You're a sinner, and so is the guy who gave you sight for your eyes. Who says that? People who are dressed like me. God is so much bigger than our religious institutions, so much nearer than our gatherings on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights. If you're wondering where you fit into this story, I can't tell you. You'll need to answer that honestly. But I can point you in one direction. If you think, as you look back over your life and the stories you tell, if you find that the stories you tell always end up with you as the hero in the story, then you're probably one of the religious leaders in this story full of the knowledge of Christ, but you still think you see. If, on the other hand, you are someone who finds it easy to praise when it's time to praise and easy to confess when it's time to confess, when it's always the time to fall on our knees before Christ and say, Lord, I believe, then you're in a pretty good place. You're in a place where you can truthfully say, oh, I see. The kingdom of God is moving on. Oh, I see. I want to be a part of it. They kicked him out of the synagogue <laughs> and kicked him right into the kingdom of heaven. May the same thing happen to you and me again and again and again. Amen. I really had a moment there. I, uh, I missed the instruction when some of the choir needed to go on to a, an event that's happening later this afternoon, and so these all came over to sit here, and, and I would have, for a minute, I thought, what did I say? And, and then I thought, I haven't said anything yet. They just, <laughs> nah, it's fine. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. You gotta watch out for people dressed like me. <clears throat> who who are who are wearing robes and stoles? <laughs> Dear friends, God is ever so close to us. 
and has been all the length of our days and stretching back all the way to Christ. He is doing works and signs, the testimony of which could be convincing in and of themselves. The Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the church. And there's a place in each of us that if we open our hearts to receive, can even this day receive more and more insight into God's kingdom. Let us not be deceived by the certainties of people who are blind but just can't stop talking. Let us instead test the spirits for ourselves. Let us receive Christ into our heart. Jesus said, if fathers who are wicked still know how to give good things to their children, how much more will my father give you the kingdom when you ask for it? The witness of our lives, the witness of my life, is that when we ask Jesus to come in, he does it like that. But there's very seldom any lightning flashing or thunder rolling, and often we're not even aware that he's come in the door. We just opened to see if he was there. He slipped past us, and we closed it again, but he's there. And if you've never said that prayer, Lord, come in. That's all it takes to become a part of the kingdom community. Lord, come in. And gradually, over the time that we live in our community together, you will come to see. You will say, oh, I, I see you now. I get it. I understand. God is with me. And the conviction of that sentence, God is with me, will be so powerful that it cannot be contested in any way invite you in the name of Jesus to affirm that prayer again today. And if you've never said it, to join with those who do. Lord, come in. Come in now. I'm ready. I'm ready to receive you. In our joys and concerns today, I want to share that uh, Mark Helm's brother, John, is home from the hospital, but he is going to be on oxygen because he has a weakened heart, and Mark is asking prayers for, for him. Uh, I also want to share with you the name Shana. I don't know the spelling, but I and my accountability partner, uh, who drives in from Redlands once a week, were at a restaurant here in the area, and she was our server. She is uh, wanting to finish off some of her education, but she's having to earn money right now. She was going down to Temecula this week to spend some time with her mother and father, just unplugging from her workaday world and just enjoying. And, and she is a Christian woman, a young person who's trying to figure out that right at the time she should have been celebrating graduations and things from high school, COVID hit. And she's trying to figure it all out. And so I told her that today we would be lifting her up, that our church is right around the corner. She's welcome to stop in any time. She has a church in Chino Hills. She has a fellowship. But I told her we'd be praying today. And perhaps if our spirits are lent to her congregation's spirit, we can get her over the hump and get her on to the next big thing. So please pray for Shana today. Pray also for our district leaders who are leading us through this congregational assessment process, and for our core team here in the congregation, and for all of one another, so that we may truly see what God is doing in our midst. So now let us sing our uh, hymn of preparation as we come to God in prayer. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we Want to see? Jesus. 
Lord, we bow our heads and we close the lids on our earthly eyes. And suddenly, we are given new sight because you are here. And oh, Lord, how we have missed the moments of this closeness as from week to week the world wears us down. Sunday seems not to come not often enough to withstand the buffering, the noises, the voices of this world, the bang and the clatter of all of those things that consume us. And you're here. You came to be with us. You kept your promise. You sustain us. You fill us with grace. You have given us the gift of this fellowship, Lord, and you have poured your spirit not only into each of us individually, but into our collective body. We are overwhelmed, Lord. We fall to the knees of our heart with our spiritual eyes open, and we begin to long for the day when our bodies and spirits and souls and minds shall be integrated into our truest self. And this is done, O oh Lord, not by our prospecting on the frontiers of philosophy or theology, but by simply yielding to you and obeying your word. And so, O oh Lord, give us the gift of obedience. Give us the gift of new sight. Give us the gift of the immediacy of your presence in every aspect of our lives. in love for one another and in love for you, we simply lay our lives before you and ask you to bless us as we join our voices to say the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Brothers and sisters, I know that you are good stewards of everything that touches your life. I know this about you, and you are faithful as you can be. If you are able to include uh, the sustaining work of FUMCO in your uh, stewardship, we are grateful uh, for the opportunity to be your partners. And so uh, as the ushers come forward, I invite you to bring before God your tithes and your offerings of love and the part of your stewardship that you would include in our common work here at, Stu at FUMCO. And the ushers, please come forward.
Lord, you have called us into discipleship to you, and you equip us for the work of your church in every way. And so now we want to join those who are sent, sent to testify to the works of Christ, to testify to the light, to walk in that place where our spiritual eyes reveal your work all around us. So accept this offering, O Lord, bless it and use it to make your work complete. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us join together in our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be We see and we see, but there's seeing and then there's seeing. May you be the people for whom God's kingdom opens wide in your sight this week. May you see with new eyes, with the spirit of the heart, with your soul. And above all else, we, we choose Christ. Christ. We choose Christ above all else. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit fill your hearts with peace and establish your homes in the grace and the love of God and keep you strong in the strength of the Lord this day and always. Amen.